In this video, I talk with new adjuster Seth Floyd about heights, how to transition into independent adjusting, and how to be ready to hit the ground running on your first ever storm deployment. We're starting right now. You're watching Adjuster TV, adjusters first. Adjuster TV is brought to you by Kaplik. Learn all about E&O and other insurance for adjusters at cplic.net slash adjuster TV and by Paysetter Claim Service. Download the remote work guide at adjustertv.com slash paysetter and by Adjuster TV Plus. Advanced scoping and estimating training videos for independent adjusters. Ride along with us at adjustertvplus.com. Hey, what's up? Matt here with Adjuster TV. For the best tips and tools for getting on the first call list as an independent adjuster, won't you subscribe to the channel? Um, so we're doing some more coaching calls. Very excited about this. And right now we have Seth Floyd on and he has um, some interesting questions um, about heights, which, you know, I mean, if you're if you're a property adjuster and you want to do field claims, um, it's definitely a concern. And I think, you know, I'll, I'll say this right up front, Seth, that uh, any any human being that has any any small like piece of common sense in their brain has like heights or it should be a concern because it's dangerous. Absolutely. Um, and then of course, you know, we want to talk about licensing, um, maybe talk a little bit about it, uh, you know, uh, career changes in general, um, and then specifically about um, changing from, you know, what you're doing now to becoming an independent adjuster and what that might look like. So. Welcome, Seth Floyd. I really appreciate you being here. And uh, to start off, why don't you kind of introduce yourself, say where you're from, um, what kind of claims experience you have, if any, kind of where you're at in your your sort of your your career journey, and what you're you know hoping to get out of this call. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be on with you. Um, secondly, so a little bit about me. I'm currently, I'm actually a deckhand on a towboat. Um, okay. And that might be coming to an end pretty soon, as we've heard. Um, so I've been looking for a change of career for a little while. My dad actually went through um, adjuster school here in Texas um, a pretty good while back, maybe back in 2019. Um, and he's the one who told me about it. So I looked into it uh, recently, just got done with my 40-hour um Texas All Lines Adjuster course. And now I'm in the process of waiting for my license to come in. I've done the application and now um, that's kind of where I'm at in my process. Um, and in terms of that, um, you know, just really excited to get started, nervous about the career change, um, what it entails for my family, you know, and a lot of the questions that I've asked you, just kind of what do I need to look forward to to get started right off the bat, you know? Okay. Um, well, so you're basically, you've, you've, you've taken a big step to get your license. Um, to, and it, did you, can I ask you who you went through your pre-licensing with? Yeah. Um, it's a place here in Texas, pretty big called the adjuster school. Okay. Okay. Right on. And those uh, guys are, are they in like Bernie? Uh, is that right. Where are those guys located? The ones that I deal with is in Dallas, Texas. Oh, okay. They're in Dallas. Okay. Somebody's in, I feel like somebody's got a school in Bernie too. Um, but there's, there's a bunch of them down there. So, well, very cool. Oh, um, so you have, um, you're waiting for that to come back through. You already, you're, you've already taken the test and everything. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Just waiting for right. my license to actually come in. Okay. Well, um, so let's talk a little bit about this kind of like, uh, maybe I'll kind of frame this in sort of the greater context of, you know, doing a career change. Um, you did mention that you're, you do have some concerns about heights. Yes. So um, ever since I was little, I mean, some heights don't bother me, but like when you're starting to talk about two story houses and stuff like that, I start getting a little bit shaky on those roofs. I used to do some stuff, work on, roofs with my dad when I was younger and I'd always get a little bit shaky. Um, you know, I could get the job done, but I always get shaky, nervous. And, uh, it was just a bad time. You know, I, I, I'm afraid of messing up, I guess, as an adjuster being nervous about it. And is there any ways that I can overcome fears of heights that won't interfere with job opportunities, you know? Okay. So yeah, I guess there's really two ways to go about it. I mean, there's, you could either, just do something different in claims 
Um, it, it kind of disqualifies, if you don't want to climb on roofs, let's put it this way, then it pretty much disqualifies you from field work because even if you are doing daily claims, there's still, you're going to get a whole like a completely random variety of claims, water claims, fire claims, and they may have wind claims thrown in there, a tree limb lands on the roof or whatever, and you mm -hmm. need to still climb some roofs. Um, the other option is, is that you fight it, <laughs> I guess, for lack of a better mm -hmm. words. In other words, you, you, if you, if you want to try to overcome your, um, you know, perfectly reasonable, I just want to make that totally clear, perfectly reasonable, um, you know, reluctance to climb high things, especially things with no guardrails on them or stairs or, you know, um, then that's, you know, I think everybody has to kind of overcome everybody who's an adjuster with probably a few exceptions, um, will occasionally get the yips on a big roof or like a, a high roof. Um, when I was starting out, um, I didn't really have a whole lot of trouble with that. Um, but I don't know if that's just because I'm just not very smart or had desensitized myself to that previously. I will say mm -hmm. that um, any adjuster that does field claims um, should treat every single roof and every time that they get anywhere near their ladder as like the most dangerous thing that they've ever done. They should, they should never become complacent ever um, because that's the, when you start doing that, when you start to get overconfident, that's when the accidents happen. Um, right. You know, a lot of times <laughs> I fall off one roof, but it was because I didn't have the ladder set up properly and I didn't go very far. Um, but everybody that I know with a few exceptions who's fallen off a roof and been injured, ended up in the, you know, an emergency room uh, was getting cocky and climbing something that was a 12, 12, um, or getting onto a pitch to try and get a photo or a measurement or something where they didn't have any, any, uh, fall protection and that they, uh, shouldn't have been on. They didn't need to do it. Um, and they right. got out a little, got out a little bit over the end of their skis and, you know, ended up on the ground, um, which is, you know, no fun. So, um, I would say you can de sort of desensitize yourself to, um, if you want to go that route to heights by getting on roofs, right? I think one of the big things that, that really helped me, um, to kind of take the nerves out on certain, certain structures that, you know, were, were the access to it. The only good place you could get on it was, you know, you've got your two story ladder up there. Um, is to make sure that your ladder is really, really well secured. That tends to bring some confidence to me, especially when, you know, going up is a lot easier than coming down off a roof. Absolutely. Um, when, you, when you're coming, when you're going up, you got momentum going up. And if you got good shoes on, you're, you're usually good to go. Um, coming back down, the momentum, gravity is pulling you down, right? So it's harder to, to stop going down than it is going up. If you have your ladder in a valley, right? So you've got to set it in a, like in a corner and there's a valley going up. Um, that'll be, you know, kind of lock the ladder in place on one side and then strap it on there really good and make sure that there's three feet of at least three feet of ladder sticking up above the edge of the gutter. If you are trying to access a house and this just goes to anybody listening to this or watching this, trying to access a roof and your ladder only peaks over the gutter by that much, even on a one story, I'm going to, strongly recommend that you don't climb that roof and that you go straight to Home Depot and buy yourself a longer ladder. Because even on those, those little short roofs, I mean, ah, it's only eight feet to the ground. Well, you can break your neck at five feet, right? Um, Absolutely. So having good equipment that you're, you feel comfortable with, like a, a sturdy ladder, you know, depending on your, they have, they come in different weight classes, right? So for light people, they can get a lighter ladder for, for people who are, you know, heavier, they can get a, a ladder that's rated up to, you know, higher uh, weight ratings, which makes them sturdier and they don't move around as much, which is a thing I think that gives people probably, I would imagine if you've climbed any roofs, just going up the ladder and having the whole thing do this, you know, is enough oh, to yeah. give, give, give me the, you know, the sweats for sure. Um, the other thing is, is, um, 
if you invest in uh, fall protection and, and fall protection training, and I would go for the fall protection training first because they, you know, they will tell you what to get, or they could even sell you gear. Um, you know, some of the IA firms have rope and harness training. Um, there's a, a company called Reality Rope Access. Let's see if I get that right. Um, who has, that's all they do is, um, you know, fall protection training for adjusters and contractors and anybody that climbs roofs. Uh, let me pull it up here real quick. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With scoper writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York, makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. Yeah, realityropeaccess.com. And I'll put the link here on the screen. Um, these guys are located in Montgomery, Texas. I don't know how close that is to you. I don't know where that is. Um, but I would recommend going to those guys and learning how to safely access a roof with fall protection. Um, these guys will teach you how to set up your gear quickly because one of the one of the drawbacks to any kind of extra fall protection or gear that you've got to use for um, accessing a building, it takes time to set it up and tear it down, right? Which makes it take, you're at the house for a longer period of time, um, which is one of the reasons why I always, I resisted using rope and harness except for on like the most absolute scariest, craziest, steepest roofs. Plenty of roofs that I probably should not have accessed without rope and harness. Um, so I would say that anybody no matter if they're nervous or totally confident, um, really, really should be using rope and harness on roofs that are that are seven twelve pitch or steeper, and you know that are uh, two story plus, um, mm -hmm. because it's you know if you slip, um, the rope will catch you, right? So if you have it set up correctly, you know you're not, and you, you have the you have it anchored properly and everything. Um, so I would check those guys out on that, and see what happens right so in other words if if you're if you're nervous about climbing on roofs um and you're like well i don't know i mean matt said get some rope and harness but i'm still nervous about it go you know call the guy on the phone you know realityropeaccess.com and um say hey i mean, I, I guarantee you that guy gets the same question all day long every day um i'm nervous about climbing on roofs um, i want to be an adjuster i really want to get into this career um how safe can i be you know, as, as an adjuster using rope and harness, using fall protection, um, does it, how much longer does it take? You can ask all these questions to these guys and they'll tell you, they'll say, you know, it takes X minutes longer, but you know, you'll be able to save time over here. Um, be able to save your life. If you fall off a roof and turn, twist your ankle, right. Or break your thumb. I mean, that mm -hmm. maybe not break your thumb, but you can be out of, that can knock you out for the whole season. If you can't walk around a house, cause you cannot climb on roofs with a broken ankle. Um, so it, it, it's not like you're, if you fall off a roof and you, you know, you have to break every rib in, in your, you know, chest and, you know, break a couple of vertebrae and break your, both your arms and get a punctured lung and get all this stuff. And that's what keeps you out. It's, th it's little tiny, small things. If you have to wear a cast or something for six weeks, you're, you're not working. They're not going to let you work and you're not going to be able to be effective in the field if you have even a small <coughs> injury. And that goes for 
walking around the house and tripping over something because you're not looking where you're walking. You look it up, right? You could trip over something and, you know, go down on your wrist and break your wrist or your elbow or something. I mean, anything can happen, right? It's not, you're outside, you're moving around. It's not exactly, you know, say if you get bit by a dog, you know, or somebody came around the corner and who knows? I mean, anything can happen. Um, right. Not that it's going to happen necessarily, <clears throat> but there's, there's a lot of dangers besides not to scare you off or anything, but um, there's a lot of dangers besides heights and falling off a roof. So I, does that help? Is that, you know, is that anything that there that you feel like? Yeah, is- absolutely. Yeah. You definitely answered um, the question pretty, pretty well. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So kind of maybe transitioning from there. So, all right. So let's say, you know, you kind of get your, your nervousness about heights under control and you're like, all right, well, I got some gear, you know, I know how to use it, I practice with it at home, I practice with it on some neighbor's houses or friend's houses or whatever, because th- doing that with any of this stuff, like you exactimate, um, with, with scoping buildings and things, if you just practice, if you haven't, if you don't have live claim, like a real claim claims in hand yet, practice, 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 practice a little bit, you know, have like a set time, two or three times a week, spend an hour messing around with your, set the rope and harness stuff up, climb up the roof, climb off, put it away neatly the way, you th- the way it'll be easy for you to get it back out again, you know, and get mm-hmm. used to your gear so that the first time you go to a house where you, and this goes for anything, like setting up your ladder, um, scoping losses, taking photos and everything else. If you haven't done it before and you do it for the first time on a loss, if the, if the homeowner's standing out there in, in the front yard watching you and you're like, trying to figure out how to turn your camera on and you're not sure which photos to, to take, it's going to have an effect on their confidence and what you, how you're going to handle that claim. So I would say practice for everything, right? So assuming that you've gotten, you know, gotten past or you're able to work with your, you know, the heights thing, um, as far as like, um, transitioning, I guess, from one career to another, this is really just general ad- advice. I would say, um, if you want to transition from working on a tugboat to becoming a CPA or to becoming a bartender or becoming a, you know, whatever it is, or becoming an adjuster, I would say that the, the same thing applies, especially if you have little kids and you said you had twins. Um, yeah. you've, your first responsibility is the financial security of, your, of you, yourself and your family, right? Obviously. Yeah. Um, you need to be able to pay your bills no matter what's going on. Um, so the thing that we always say on our side, in our industry is don't quit your day job until you start getting claims. Um, I would drill down a little bit on that and say, all right, so right now it's January. Um, sorry, right now it's February. This year's already, <laughs> it's going to be, rolling back. Sep- I know it's going to be September before we even know it. Um, so it's, it's a little bit early in the year, right? Which is good. You're, you're in a good position. If you if you're like you know what I'm all in on this this career change I think this is going to be great for our family. Um, one main thing I would say that you you have to have a proper expectation about and that is that um, this is not a job where you're entitled to work or that they pay you for just showing up. Which I think you if you've watched any videos or been on social media you probably figured out already. Um, so in other words, it's you know if you, if you start out on catastrophe doing wind and hail which would be climbing every roof, every roof of every house you get assigned pretty much. Um, mm-hmm. It's going to be feast or famine, we say, right? So it's it really, and what that means is, is it just depends on the weather. Um, and as a new person, um, you're going to be a little bit farther down the, on the, the roster than people who have experience and who are a known quantity. Um, so somebody who's already got three or four storms under their belt, or several years of experience and they've developed a relationship with the IA firms and the carriers, they're going to get work before you do. So it needs to be like a big event to happen for Seth Floyd to get the call and say, Hey, Seth, we got something going on in Dallas. You want to go? Um, so a lot of carriers, um, have, uh, requirements like state farm, for example, as last I checked, um, has a requirement that on uh, catastrophe deployments that the IA firms bring in a certain number of new people so that they can kind of keep refreshing the rank. So they have a requirement for that. Other ones don't. They won't get dip into their, re- their reserve roster until they absolutely have to. 
Um, so it's kind of incumbent on, on a new person, um, somebody who's transitioning from one career to another to get all the trainings you can get your hands on, um, practice that training once you've, once you've gotten it, right? So you get some Xactimate training, maybe you get an Xactimate level two or level three certification. It's not good enough to just have that. You need to practice claims scenarios, right? So you need to have, pretend like you got a water spot on the ceiling, do a whole full claim, scope it, take pictures, risk photo, important label photos, do diary entries, do a GLR, do, you know, create an estimate, use sketch, all that stuff. And it doesn't have to be like a total loss, um, but just something to get you going through the process so that you see every step, right. as many steps as possible, right? Because that's, th that's the thing on, when you have people on hurricanes, their biggest sticking point is, is that they, they, don't, they haven't seen the process from start to finish for closing a claim. Uh, so they, it, this, this, as soon as they see that process from start to finish where they've got a help room person helping them or uh, some other mentor or a, a beneficent adjuster who wants to help them out, um, shows them the whole process. Your claim is now closed. You've seen the whole process. That's when the speed really starts to pick up is because they're like, oh, okay, I get it. These are all the things I, I need to do. I've seen it now. I know the lay of the land I can go. Um, right. So you need to, to practice your practice doing claims. Um, and then in the meantime, if you're going to transition out of, uh, your current career and, you know, it's a, it's not dependent on whether you just saying, all right, I'm giving to my two weeks and I'm out of there. It's going to be like, well, they're going to tell me in two weeks that I got to go. Um, either way you have to have income coming in. Um, so there, are, there's a number of, basically what I tell people is I say, you know, you need to find work that's easy to get and easy to quit and then easy to get again, um, which is stuff like Uber Eats, right? I like doing, the, and I did this for a while. I did like the food and stuff delivery over mm -hmm. doing the, like the, the driver, like the, the being an Uber driver or a Lyft driver. Uh, I, and I, cause I did both and I found that I really, really like doing the delivery stuff because I didn't have people in the car. I didn't have to keep candy in the car and like chargers and keep the car spotless and all this kind of stuff. I could drive whatever car I had and right. I could, I could take corners and roll through, not to say that I'm going to break traffic laws, but I could, I could drive a little bit less like carefully, like I've got, you know, passengers who are going to tip me. I needed to get the, 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 the Applebee's dinner to the family in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I'm not going to speed or anything, but anyway, my long story short, um, work like doing Uber Eats, DoorDash, Postmates. Um, I did Postmates for a long time. Um, you can find local work. Um, I mean, it's, well, you can, you can get work in the claims industry um, with inspectors on demand, which is uh, inspectorsondemand.com, um, which is a, basically it's an app-based um, insurance like photo we call it photo and scope work where um you download an app onto your phone you probably have to go through an orientation and apply or whatever um but then you'll get assignments on your phone and you accept accept the assignment you know you may i don't think you i don't know if you have to call the insured or not or if they just set the appointment up and then you just show up you know if that's the case okay. and you go to the go to the insurance house knock on the door. Hey, I'm Seth Floyd. You know, I'm here with the, you know, your insurance company. I'm here to take photos and measure and everything. And, and then, uh, your desk adjuster will get back to you. And then you walk around the house and you take pictures with your phone, you know, following the prompts in the phone. And when you're done say, thank you so much. If you have questions, call this number. Bye. And then you're all, that's it. You're completely done with it. And so that will help you learn how to scope. Um, what part of Texas are you in? Um, I am Southeast Texas. Southeast. Okay. So you're okay. Um, is there like, what's a major city near you? Um, I actually, um, Houston. Okay. Yeah. So Houston's a gigantic city, right? So there's probably going to find some of this kind of work if you're able to commute to, to Houston, um, or in the nearby areas where there's a little bit of like, you know, population concentration, that's where you're going to find more claims on the app based stuff. The other one is wegolook.com. And that, so in, inspectors on demand is a uh, pilot catastrophes 
photo and scope outfit. We go look is Crawford's and it's basically the same thing. Um, you know, app based, you accept or decline assignments and, you know, to use your phone to take pictures and stuff like that. I would start doing those immediately, right? Cause you can, okay. um, I think that you can specify when you're available, right? So if you're like only available on Saturday and Sunday, uh, or Tuesdays or whatever day it is, or, you know, in the evenings after three o'clock, um, in the mornings before 11, whatever your schedule allows, I would start doing that. Start, start learning a little bit of the scoping process. I think the scoping process is the easiest part of the whole, everything that you have to do as a claims adjuster. Um, it's the funnest part because you're kind of investigating a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, every, every house is kind of like a, a little bit of a puzzle. Um, when you get there and you're going to want to figure out what's wrong and what you can pay and, you know, figuring out, making sure that you're able to, as a full adjuster, when you're writing an estimate, uh, but, but scoping the, the loss in such a way that you, you get all of the information that the desk adjuster, who's going to write the claim is going to need to write the claim. Right. Um, and it's a good way to, um, just take one piece of the claims process and learn it really, really well. Um, especially if you're willing to do some volume and take as many as they'll give you. Um, I don't know how much those pay, it changes, um, it's changed over the years. Um, but I think if you, if you, you know, no matter what, whether you're a full fledged claims adjuster and you're writing checks and, you know, writing the estimates in the whole nine yards, claims is kind of a volume game, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, um, some people ask about the money and, you know, oftentimes you'll see on social media that, um, you know, people will say, well, you know, the first question you need to ask is what's the pay? Um, if yeah. you're brand new, I, you shouldn't be asking that. Um, you yeah. should be asking, how can I help? How can I, what's the best thing I can do to learn, to help you the best way that I can and advance my career, right? The pay will come because once they start, once they see that you're, you know, as you progress and you, you're figuring things out, things are clicking, you're showing up, you're saying yes to everything with a smile, being super friendly and being somebody that they want to work with, um, personality wise, they'll keep you busy and that's where the money comes in, right? It's, it's getting, absolutely. it's getting your first set of claims right on, and then getting more claims on that, that first assignment, that first deployment. And then when that deployment's done, getting more deployments, right? And then, so you, it just snowballs. Um, that's a little bit where some of the burnout comes in. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things where you can, there's so many different things to do in this industry that you can kind of craft your own sort of like the career that makes sense for you. Um, mm. You know, it's talking, talking about, um, supporting your family and stuff, you know, just to kind of wrap up my thoughts on, on like transitioning. Um, if you're able to, to, to find work that's easy to like start and stop, it's, it's kind uh -huh. of critical for being a, a claims, uh, an independent property adjuster um, or even an auto adjuster, if, especially if you travel or you do cat or anything. Um, because I always, I always insist that people, protect their, the money that they make on cat. Right. So always be working even when you're not working claims, um, to, to get started, you know, again, this is February. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, you've got, who knows what could happen. I mean, anything could happen. We get another deep freeze in Texas. I mean, and a lot of new people got their start on that one from last year, but mm. that's not a common event. Um, so you're probably looking at May before, you know, there would be a cat, um, you know, event that would be big enough to start throwing a lot of newer folks at, um, short of that, you know, hurricane season officially starts, I think the first of June. Um, but statistically, and from my experience as a, an adjuster has been doing it since 99, um, the, all the landfalling hurricanes that do anything usually happen between the middle of August and the middle of October, right? So with mm -hmm. September being that peak, so you kind of have you kind of have to wait till late summer um, if there's no hailstorms or, no, or no big enough hail. So there's always a hailstorm somewhere, um, but if you transition into doing the 
the photo and scope stuff with inspectors on demand, we go look.com. Um, and there's a bunch of other ones. If, if you're, you know, familiar with the IA firms, a lot of them have their own photo and scope platform where you, it's just app based and you can just jump in and, and you can do, I would say if it were me, I'd get on, we go look and sign up with them. I'd sign up with inspectors on demand. I'd see who else has, has a program and maybe do an, like three, right. Do three of those. And just, yeah. just like if you're doing like Uber eats and Uber, right. Sometimes people will stack yeah. those. Um, and then if you have to leave your tugboat career, um, early, you know, the next month or two or three before storm season really kicks up, then you, you'll be able to like kind of ramp into doing some, some more like the gig economy based kind of work stuff, um, that right. allows you to turn it on and off. I'm available. I'm not available with the click of a button. You know, if, if, if somebody calls you and says, Hey, we need you to go to, you know, little rock for a hailstorm, and you've got we go look and inspectors on demand going. You just go in there and turn those off, and then nobody's. Yeah. You don't have to give anybody any notice. You just go right. Just do what you got to do. Um, once you get, um, so yeah. So I guess you know ultimately, there's always risk with any career change, right? You've got, you you're established and you're you're set in in your current job, um, but. You know, the, the financial um, security of your family is absolutely paramount. Save as much money as you can. Uh, if you got big car payments and things like that, you might consider getting you know, breaking out the old Dave Ramsey financial piece and, uh, you know, trying to trim things down so that your expenses, one way to give yourself a raise mm -hmm. you know, is to reduce your expenses, to reduce the amount of money that goes out every month. Want to work from home? I thought that might get your attention. I'll cut to the chase here and tell you that the IA firm Paysetter Claim Service frequently has work from home opportunities for the field and also for desk work, which let's be honest, really just means work at home in your PJs. Still wanna work in the field though? Paysetter's Evo platform is fully integrated with Hover. It is the best of the app-based claims handling systems out there right now. Technology is moving faster than ever and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. We put together a free guide to maximizing your productivity while working at home in your pajamas, along with a link to apply to this dynamic firm. And you can find both at adjustertv.com slash paysetter. All right, so I guess one of your questions here, um, how do you find work right off the bat? I guess I just answered that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Much. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so any thoughts or, you know, comments or ideas, more questions well, based you, on what we're talking about? You said something a while ago that um, I've kind of been nervous about, kind of racking my brain about, you know, thinking about how it's going to happen. Like when you, let's say that you do get work within the next storms or whatever that, that do come, um, you go out in the field. Is there anyone there that um, helps you get started or is it just kind of like, hey, we need you out there and they kind of throw you to the wolves, so to speak. Um, Cause you know, I'm really nervous about how to write a claim. If anybody's going to be able to teach me how to close them or what I'm supposed to do, you know, and that kind of thing. I've been nervous about that. Sure. Well, I will tell you that it, it depends on um, the, the I firm and the carrier um, that you go out with uh, for example, and, and also the event type. Right. So in other words, if you, if your first storm deployment is a windstorm, you know, in some medium sized town somewhere, um, the chances of them having a, a lot of like major resources there to help new folks like help rooms and field support, field support people and that kind of thing is not as good as if they have uh, a major hurricane and they they know that they're that a very very large percentage of the adjusters that they bring in are new, right? Or they they that have never handled the claim before or have limited experience with it. So they because they can get in a lot of trouble. Not to go off into the weeds too much, but they can get in a lot of trouble from the state. Like if there's a hurricane that hits Florida, for example, Florida has rules about when you know if if, if you as a homeowner file a claim. You know, a hurricane hits your house, right? And did a bunch of damage, and you're like, ah, dang it! Call your insurance company. 
Florida law says that your insurance company has to call you, you know, have an adjuster contact you within a certain period of time, have that insurance adjuster come to your house and inspect within like a week or less. Um, and to give you monthly or weekly reports or have an estimate written within a certain period of time. So they, they will throw warm bodies at hurricanes. They've been doing it since I started and they did it as recently as Ida, which was just a few months ago. Um, I don't mm. think it's wonderful. Um, you know, as a homeowner, I don't live on the coast, thankfully, but you know, if I did, I wouldn't appreciate that. I don't think that the carriers appreciate it. I know the IA firms don't like to do it. And adjusters that have, you know, to, to your point, to your question, you know, adjusters with no or, or a small amount of experience or limited training, it's not fair to them either because you kind of get, you do get thrown to the wolves in a lot of cases, um, which is why that preparing, spending money on your own, you know, and maybe not even spending a lot of money, but, but using your own resources, whether it's time, you know, traveling someplace, getting hotel rooms and things like that, getting the best training that you can get your hands on and then practicing, it's going to help you when you get deployed and you go into a help room and you see that there's 75 people in there and they're, they're standing four deep around a, a conference room table in a, some little tiny little room at, at the hotel, at some hotel. And there's three people in there to help everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. You're never going to get, unless you grab somebody by the hair and like pull them over, you know, gently and sit them down next to you and say, <laughs> please help me with this. Um, because they got to try and help everybody. And a lot of the people that are in there will have, will be completely unprepared. They'll be pulling their laptops out of the box and pulling the wrapper off of it and trying to find the, the power button, right? That's what you're mm. going to happen. And that's, you don't want to be in that room any longer than you absolutely have to. Um, so I think the thing that, that will insulate you the most from, from, uh, Again, it's the same thing with the roofs, I guess, is to sort of desensitize yourself to the process. Um, so get good training, practice the training, practice, 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 practice. Um, because the thing that makes, you know, not to, to kind of beat, the, beat a dead horse, but the thing where you make your money is going to be on, the thing that makes you money is that repetition, that muscle memory to get through claims faster. Um, to make sure that everything is, that needs to be in there is in there and that and you should do it in a timely manner right so it's it's okay when you first start out to go slow um but you ultimately by the end of your first event need to have be able to close at least four claims a day this is what i right. i think is is reasonable but at the at the very beginning um you get you do one right Monday morning, 9 a.m., you go do you go look at one and take as long as you need to, no matter how big or small the claim is, take as long as you need to, and then take that one claim and all the photos and everything that you took and your scope notes and all that stuff and take it to the help room or find, if you've got, if we're assigned a field support person, say, hey, let me buy you uh, some tacos or a cup of coffee or whatever, meet me at Starbucks over here on this side of town and help me close this claim, right? And if you can get that person to go with you on that first one, um, a lot of on hurricanes, a lot of companies will have field support people, like a field manager that's supposed to be kind of sort of a trainer, jack of all trades person that will help you. Um, a lot of times they don't, um, but you, you should be able to get some help somewhere. But if you just try to do one a day for the first, I'd say week, maybe five, six days, um, and you're closing those claims, as soon, like I said earlier, as soon as you see that process from start to finish, if Monday you know, you got to the storm on Friday and you went through orientation and you made early calls on Sunday. Monday, you have one closed claim. You've seen the process from start to finish, right? Which is going to help you close the claim that you scheduled for Tuesday faster, right? Mm -hmm. And right, absolutely. The big, the big thing that make, takes a lot of time is trying to figure out what to do next, right? Making calls, texting people, sending an email, nobody's responding because they're all busy, right? Because just if you're not able to close the claim because you don't know what to do next and it's a super duper simple thing, right? Check this box and you're done. Right. And you didn't know that. And you spent two and a half hours trying to figure that out, get that done on Monday. Right. And then you'll know all the little steps and you'll groove them in, um, as you progress through the weeks. Right. I, you, you want to ramp up to closing as many claims as possible per day, but you got to be realistic about it and you have to leave yourself room to learn, which I think is, Forgetting all the resources, you know, that may or may not be there, 
being prepared and building into your schedule time to learn to, to, to see the claims workflow from start to finish are the two biggest things that will help you be successful when you when you get on your first cat deployment um, you'll have managers and other adjusters and whoever you know your phone will be ringing off the hook but they'll tell you they'll say get out there and scope as much as you can scope and scope and scope and scope you know forget don't worry about writing claims right now you just need to get out there and scope if you do that you're dead right that's where this the sink comes in that's when the wolves drag you off into the darkness and in the, in the bushes and it's, it's over right because you you're gonna mm -hmm. it snowballs out of control very 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 quickly because what you'll think is it's like all right well you know um, i'll try to look at seven a day and then i'll try to write those up that night right well for every claim that night that you weren't able to close you have to add it to the next night right so you closed four night one we got three more right so you add those to, to tuesday's nightly you know uh estimate write up total so that's seven plus three is what ten and you got ten to write up on tuesday if you, if you could only do five again then you add five to i mean it just it snowballs instantly and then you'll find that you're getting one hour of sleep every night and you're having a panic attack and you're sending me text messages and emails going, Matt, what do I do? And I'll say, did you start with just one claim? No, they told me to do every, all of them. <laughs> and then I'll say, well, yeah. take it, take, take three days off, write up everything that you already scoped, you know, cancel and reschedule those appointments and then start over doing two claims a day, whatever. You know, and that makes up. sense because I remember now watching, you know, one of your videos, I watch your channel a lot to try to get information and, one of them you're talking about being a quality adjuster over a quantity adjuster. You know, obviously sure. you don't want to take all day doing your stuff, but I remember you talking about that um, scheduling, like do one here, one here. I think it was work three days and then take three days as your office days. Three um, and to one. To get those so, claims closed. So three field days, one office day, three yeah. field days, one, one office day. day. Yeah. But I remember watching that video and that makes sense now. Um, you definitely, I, I I don't think that I would want to do too much scope in doing that because you're right. That puts you behind. And then like you talk about, you get kickbacks and that's never good. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, that's the other thing is that if you, if you limit what you do right up front, then it gives you, it gives the file reviewers and whoever's looking at your file, who's the gatekeeper, right? Before you get paid, it gives them the opportunity to look at your work and send back a message or call you. Sometimes they'll call you if they know you're new and say, Hey, listen, I was looking at, you know, Mr. Smith's claim here, claim number, blah, blah, blah. Um, everything looks good. Your photos look good. Um, but here's six things that we need to do differently or that I recommend that you do or, or in order to get this fi these files to go through faster, do these things. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you forgot these eight things fix those and then send the file back up, right? You calibrate yourself, right? You learn like the general, like broad strokes of how to do the claims on your own through the adjuster training, whether it's going to Caddy, the caddinstitute.com, going to Vail Training Solutions, going to Mile High, going to Veteran Adjusting School, going to the adjuster school, going to any, wherever it is, right? They'll teach you how to use Xactimate, how to scope some damage ID, a little bit of construction, a little bit of policy, right? Um, mm -hmm. you take that stuff as general knowledge, then you'll get it, the, the knife edge kind of like honed in on it when you start handling actual claims. Cause they will, they'll say, um, you know, these are the things that need to be in the file. The, the headers miss, you're missing the headers on, on all the files. You may not learn that at one of the schools, right? Like how to put a header in probably will at, at all of them, but it's just as an example, um, they right. will get you like. Schools will get you to here, right? And then doing the work being and practicing will get you to there. And then you'll get honed in to like that laser, laser level. Once you start getting claims and you have the, the people that are going to write your paycheck telling you to fix stuff. Once you fix it once, then you, you should be able to remember not to do it again. So you're not going to get files kicked yeah. back for, you shouldn't get files kicked. And this is the other thing that happens is that if you, if you do try to like scope a whole bunch and then take five days and write them all up and send them all in, every single one of those claims is gonna come back with the same corrections that if you just turned in one and they said, hey, you forgot the header, it's the wrong price list and don't put this in the diary, right? If you did that on 50 claims, you gotta correct all 
at least those things on 50 claims instead of just one claim if you just go right. one at a time. One claim, turn it in, see what the file review, because they'll probably send it back unless you had somebody actually sitting down and helping you write it, who's the manager, which you could get. I mean, it's in, ideally that you, you have that situation where you have a help room person or a manager, but if you get, if you, you know, either way, one correction is a lot easier to do instead of having to do that same correction on 50 claims or 30 claims or whatever, because it could take you all day long to do that, right? And if it changes the, the total on the estimate and you're responsible for settling up with the homeowner, then that's 30 or 50 phone calls you got to make, right? Absolutely. So it's, everything snowballs. So the, the, if you build stuff into your, if you build flexibility and time into your schedule to not only to like tackle the phone calls in a certain period of time, right? Because your phone's going to ring off the hook, do inspections in a certain period of time, do your, write your estimates in a certain period of time and leave some space in there to, to learn, right? It should take you half an hour to do like a, a typical wind claim with a tree on the hit the gutter and knocked the, you know, did some damage to the roof and, you know, maybe a little piece of siding got knocked off. That claim should take you a half an hour to write. But as a brand new person, it might take you three hours to write it. So give yourself three hours, right, right to start. Because in that way, you're not going to have a panic attack when you're like, well, I was going to try to do seven claims tonight and I'm still, it's two and a half hours and I'm still on this first one and it's just a tree. So those are my pieces of advice to help, you know, to help people in your shoes who are new and you're nervous about the process because you're afraid, you know, that you're, you could wash out, right? And it's, it's very, the, right. the, the risk is, is pretty high. Um, but if you, if you get good training, spend the money on it, um, make sure you've got money saved back for, for your storm expenses and to pay your bills at home while you're gone. Um, and practice. A little bit doesn't have to be, like I said, you don't have to spend practice three hours a day. You could practice 20 minutes at, you know, three or four or five times a week. Just do like, mm -hmm. you know, well, how would I replace that baseboard? Right. And do some research on like, what happens if baseboard gets wet? Can you save it? You know, what if the drywall behind the baseboard is damaged, but the, the baseboard's fine? Can you pull the baseboard off without it getting damaged? Or do you have to just throw it away and replace it with new? You know, how do you, what's a, you know, paint for that stain, Right. And then write a little estimate based on that. Right. So take some photos, import and label the photos because that's something that slows people down. So you, you build muscle memory. Every time you do one of these little scenarios, water spot on the ceiling, you know, window frame has has dents on it. Do some research. Can I replace the wind? Can I replace just the, the cladding on the window or does the whole unit have to go? Right. Um, you can call the manufacturer. Right. I mean, that's as an adjuster, a really detail oriented adjuster will be making phone calls like that. Um, but that gives you an opportunity to sort of like um, give yourself a crash course in construction and restoration processes, as well as the claims process, at least from a scoping and estimating point of view and doing a little bit of the admin work. Because when you do get on a storm, you're going to get the carriers. A lot of carriers have like their own like proprietary um, back end systems, claim management systems mm -hmm. that you have to learn. Um, State Farm's got a big one. Um, all states got one. You'll have you'll have to have room in your schedule when you go you deploy to learn that stuff as well, which is what the carrier certifications are for before you ever go on your on your first CAT event. When the, an IA firm says, "Hey, come take our free training," and you go, and they're all talking about State Farm the whole time, that's a that's a carrier certification. They're going to teach you how to uh, all about carry, uh, State Farm's estimating guidelines. You know, which is how they want you to handle things. Like if you if you go up on a roof and you see just see hail dents on turtle vents, State Farm wants you to handle that in a certain way, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so, and they'll have some huge gigantic document that's got everything you possibly ever think of in it. Um, and they will teach you how to use ECS or whatever State Farm is using now, which is their proprietary backend system. So when you set up a file. You know, you have to get in there before you call the homeowner and make sure you check off the boxes, put your name in, maybe set a reserve and do do an activity diary and a bunch of stuff, right? And you got to know how to do that before you, because that could take you, that's one of those things that it's like a, should take you five minutes and it could take you five hours because you just don't know how to do it, right? And it goes for anybody. It doesn't matter how good or bad you are at computers. Um, so what do you think? Helpful? Yeah, I think a lot of your information has been very helpful. Um, helped me helped me so far get in the right mindset of what I'm getting into. 
Okay. Maybe still into it. Did I scare you oh, off? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, you didn't scare me off. Um, actually, you know, I've, I've talked to a few people, um, who's been in the adjuster field and you've definitely made it more clear to understand than they have. A lot of those guys that I talked to, they were actually more about scoping out all the time and then trying to close every one of them at the same time. Um, so you definitely put everything more into perspective than they could. Sure. And I will say one thing about that. Um, there are a lot of like top shelf, 5%, you know, top level adjusters, probably most of them actually, that will scope. They'll start at seven o'clock in the morning and they'll scope till three o'clock in the afternoon and then they'll take a nap and then they'll crack open their computer and write estimates until 10 or 11 o'clock at night, right? Once you get up to speed, you can decide however you want to handle claims if you want to do it like that. I always did it. I got trained on my very first storm ever to close claims on site through the whole the th whole entire claim. Um, people don't believe that I was a fast adjuster. I was a very fast adjuster closing claims on site. And I think a, a big part of that was that um, it, it deleted a lot of the extra work that you have to do if you scope and scope and scope and then write and write and write, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm able to uh, miss less damage. I didn't have to make a follow-up settlement phone call because I settled with the homeowner right there on the spot. Um, so it's, it saved time and it freed up time in my schedule to close more claims, but getting started, you know, anybody that tells you to, to their very first every day, just to get out there and scope like crazy and, and like a mad person is it might work for them and they might think that it will work for you because they think, feel like that that's going to move the needle on, on you being successful. But the truth of the matter is, and I think any, any carrier, any like director of training at any IA firm will agree with me on this. And I've talked to, I've talked to a lot of people about this um, and they all agree, listen, they need to, they need to see the process of closing the claim and then you can ramp your speed up, right? They will the absolutely 100,000%, you have to close claims. And you gotta close all the claims that you have and you have to get more claims in order for it to be worth it, right? Mm -hmm. So, but you can't, if you, if you try to like go, if you try to run before you walk, it, it's not gonna work, it, it won't. Some people make it work. There's always an exception and somebody might pop in the comments and. Well, you know, I totally did it that way. I mean, it was great. You're the exception that proves the rule. The rule is, and this is what I strongly recommend as an experienced adjuster and somebody that has trained adjusters for a long time. Only this is, and this is the golden rule of, of claims, only scope which you can close that day, right? right? So everything that you scope on Monday needs to be closed by the end of the, the day on Monday, whether it's by dinner time or it's by two o'clock in the morning or whatever, those claims need to be closed. Right. And do, so don't schedule, mm -hmm. schedule with that in mind in the very beginning, schedule, build in those, that extra buffer for learning. And you'll be up to five, six, seven, maybe eight claims a day before you know it, especially on smaller losses, you'll be rocking and rolling instead of, you know, going back to your tugboat boss and saying with your hat in your hand going, man, can I get my job back? <laughs> Which you probably don't want to do. No. no. So any other questions you got? Do you can think of? No, I think you just about covered it all. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. No problem. Well, listen, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, this will probably air sometime in the next few weeks. Um, but uh, uh, thank you, you know, for, for giving me the opportunity to, to chat with you. It's, it's no, always, thank you. it's, it's always good for us to, you know, to remember kind of like who we're doing adjuster TV for. And that's for, for guys like you, you got questions, you have concerns and worries and, you know, we try to do our best to, to help you out, to, you know, soothe those worries and fears, um, or, you know, pour gasoline on them if, if that's necessary. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, well, absolutely. Um, but I, I enjoy the channel, Matt, I watch adjuster TV all the time for information. So it's been, um, Good to talk to you about it. Thanks a lot, Seth. Um, have fun with those those babies and uh, good luck. And again, you've got my email address. If you have any questions or whatever, just, just hit me up. <laughs> hey, thank you.
You bet. We'll catch you later. This is Adjuster TV. We snore so loudly that it scares everyone in the car we're driving.